Hello, we're now going to focus on legal issues and look at the three laws you need to know about for this paper. Probably nobody's most favourite topic, but it's something which is really important for a computer scientist to be at least a little bit aware of. But before we look at those laws, let's talk a bit more generally about the sort of legal issues you could well be asked about in a few different questions, but in particular, maybe an eight marker. And when we have to weigh up or discuss legal issues, we have to somehow give both benefits and drawbacks because technology has made some improvements for law enforcement agencies like the police, but in other ways has made it harder. And we need to have some of these ready to go for different exam questions. So to give you some examples of how technology might have helped law enforcement, we're able to automate a lot of the process. Things like speed cameras can automate punishments, automate sanctions for people speeding, whereas a police officer would have to stand there with a camera previously. Now it can be done automatically. Mobile phones are an amazing resource for police officers because we can track movements of people, both criminals, but also people who are missing, for example, who you want to try and find because they're connecting to cell towers. We can essentially know roughly where each individual person is located. That's really important for investigations. And because we've got so much storage capacity nowadays, we're able to keep very long term records of people and crimes. So back in the day, it'd be done using paper be very, very difficult for a police officer to search through loads of paper documents. They might have to eventually chuck out certain paper documents because there were so many. Whereas nowadays it can be stored on a database, split across multiple computers, and it means a DNA test from 20 years ago can be kept and then eventually a criminal could get caught because we are keeping records long term. But of course, technology has made certain things harder for agencies like the police because crime is able to happen from a long distance. And people can hide where they are located through things like VPNs, which mask where someone is actually located. And of course, if they're doing it for a different country, the UK police might not have what's called jurisdiction over those people. They can't just go into another country and arrest somebody. So that can make things very, very challenging. A lot of scams originate outside of the UK because the scammers know the UK police can't do much about it. And when law enforcement do come across some crucial evidence, the criminal might be savvy and might have encrypted it and even the police aren't able to understand what the encrypted text says unless they somehow can figure out the encryption key so this might include messages being sent it might include files on a computer if they're encrypted well it's not really usable to the police and somewhat linked to that first point because we are able to have lots of crime happening online now it's sort of doubling for potential areas where crime can happen both virtually on computers but as well as the physical crimes the police still have to keep up with. So it's just adding more crimes for law enforcement to have to investigate and deal with, which is going to make it harder for them. And the sort of crimes which can happen online involve things like malware and also hacking. And they're made illegal through the Computer Misuse Act, which first originated in 1990. So this is there to try and make hacking and malware illegal. Now, these are called pieces of legislation. You've got to learn three of these for the exam. For word legislation, you can substitute for law. So these are three laws. And laws conventionally have the date or the year, at least, they were first enacted in their title. So that's why there'll be dates after each of these three pieces of legislation. Worth trying to roughly know where this is, but that's not the sort of thing you have to memorise. What you need to memorise is what are the key principles of each law. You're not a lawyer yet. So you don't need to know this in loads of detail, but we need to know roughly what each of these laws is allowing and what is it prohibiting. So what this law says is you cannot access or damage a computer without permission. So accessing a computer without permission is called unauthorized access. And that relates to hacking. Hacking is where somebody tries to access a computer without permission. And malware is malicious software. As you know, that can cause damage to a computer system that is not allowed unless the owner of a computer system somehow gave you permission to do that. So to give you some examples of where this law might apply, if somebody was brute forcing a friend of theirs password without the friend knowing, and if they somehow gained access to the computer, well, that is illegal. They might be best mates, but if the person didn't know they were essentially hacking into their computer, that would not be allowed according to this law. Whereas if we were, say, performing a penetration test for a company and we were doing something quite dodgy ordinarily, like installing spyware, that would be actually legal, according to this law, assuming that company definitely, definitely, definitely gave you permission to do that. But something like using SQL injection, 
to try and delete data from a, a random website would definitely be illegal because that website won't have given you permission to do that. Now, depending on how successful these two attacks are, will depend on what exactly the sanction is, if any sanction. But what's important to realize is this law is punishing individuals. It's not punishing companies. So an individual person, the hacker or the malware creator would be punished and it can lead to prison sentences in the most severe cases. The next piece of legislation to look at is the Data Protection Act, a much more recent bit of legislation. And this, as opposed to the Computer Misuse Act, aims at organizations, so not individual people. And it's aiming to ensure that organizations look after personal data. Companies collect so much data about us, this law ensures that it's been looked after and isn't, they're not being careless with our data. Now, personal data is data that can be used to identify a person. So for example, if your exam results got leaked, but all it was was a bunch of numbers on a page, that wouldn't be personal data because I can't tell it was your exam results just from those numbers. But if it was leaked alongside your name, well, your name would then tell me, oh, those are your exam results, therefore it becomes personal data. So there are loads of examples of personal data, but they must be linked to you somehow, name, address, phone number, etc. These are all examples of personal data which are covered by this law. But there are certain pieces of personal data which are more sensitive and if the company was being careless with these, they would get punished a lot more severely. So medical history, beliefs, sexual orientation, ethnicity, those are more serious according to this law. And if organizations don't comply, don't follow this law, they can get fined. You can't send a company to prison, so we only really deal with fines here, but the fines can be really, really quite big, especially if it is a big company. Now, the police don't really get involved in prosecuting this law. It's handled by the ICO which is another agency, they will investigate and they will fine if they think the organization hasn't met this legislation. And there's a long list of things which the organizations have to comply with to meet this law. So first of all, must inform you when data is going to be collected and get your consent before collecting. And you'll see this a lot on websites where you are, when you go on a website for the first time, you're faced with lots of pop-ups asking for your agreement that is what that is trying to do, both inform you and get your consent. We also need to make sure that once we are collecting personal data, there is adequate security in place so that a hacker can't just easily access all of these personal bits of data. So the law doesn't say you have to have encryption, you have to have a firewall. Those are the sort of things which you'd expect an organization to have, along with anti-malware, along with physical security and all those other methods you've learned about. If you were hacked and you had a big data breach and the ICO felt that you hadn't put in adequate security, that would make the fine even bigger. Now, once you have users' personal data, they've got the right to request it so they can see what data is being held about them. And they're also, further to this, able to request it's changed or even delete it. So if you tell YouTube you want to delete your account, YouTube have to delete it under this law because it's just one of the conditions. And generally speaking, organizations can't just hold on to this data for years and years and years. They are only allowed to keep it while it is necessary. And this is why certain accounts might get deleted after a certain number of years, because holding that data when they're not actually using the account is potentially illegal according to this law. Now, the last law we'll look at is a bit of a mouthful for Copyright Designs and Patents Act. And all of these laws are very, very complicated. This is probably the most complicated. There are lawyers whose whole job it is, is to interpret this law. But what it's broadly aiming to do is protect intellectual property, sometimes shortened to just IP. So intellectual property are creations of the mind, basically ideas. So if you're writing an article in a magazine, you are coming up with an idea, you're choosing what words to write and in what order. If you are drawing some art, that is based on your ideas. Likewise, making a film, writing a song, and also, for our purposes, writing software is an example of intellectual property. Because to write a program requires you coming up with an idea, it requires you choosing what bits of code to write and when, that is covered by this legislation. And the reason why this legislation exists is because, to be honest, these are all very easy to steal. It's not very hard to steal somebody's idea. And so there needs to be some protection in place, otherwise nobody would try and make any money from these and probably we wouldn't have all the different films and songs and bits of software we want to be able to use. 
So this law contains quite a few things. Most relevant for computer scientists probably is copyright. Now copyright is automatically applied. So as soon as you create your article or your art piece or your bit of software, you're able to just stick a copyright symbol on it to tell people that you own the copyright to this. And what that means is you control how you decide it to be used by other people because other people cannot use your copyrighted work without your permission. It's illegal to do so. So I can't just download your film unless you give me permission to do so. And ordinarily this comes through licensing, which we'll talk more about in the next video as it relates to software. Now, actually a lot of the kind of punishment and work which relates to copyright isn't done via the police because most websites simply just allow you to report and then they will take down any instances of copyrighted content being used without permission. So if somebody just steals all my videos, I'm able to ask YouTube to take them down if I can prove they belong to me. And if it was quite a severe case or YouTube or another company wasn't handling it correctly, I've got the right to sue the person I think is breaching my copyright. And you see this sometimes with songwriters suing each other because they believe the other songwriter stole their idea. This is not done via the police. This is done separately in other courts, but it can lead to large effectively fines people who are proven to have stolen some copyrighted material. And occasionally the police will get involved, often for very serious offences, which could lead to fines or even imprisonment. Here is an example of somebody who was essentially selling a tool to allow copyrighted material to be seen easily. They got sent to prison because it was quite a serious breach. But long story short, a bit like the Computer Misuse Act, the main thing is permission. Copyrighted work requires the owner's permission to use it correctly. And that links to licensing, which will be covered in the next video.